Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Very reverend fathers, brothers, priests, and brothers and sisters, dear youth. I'm so glad to see you in such a great number. Okay, you might ask or wonder why this topic during the Lent? I had some positive reasons for it and some negative reasons for it. Among the positive reasons are some personal reasons and some professional vocational reasons. As you know, I'm a married priest and as majority of us priests are all married. I'm married priest with for 40, 43 years and I have four children and seven grandchildren, soon to be eight. So that's one of the reasons. I married very young, when I was 20. Yes, I have to admit to you, to encourage you. I had issues in my marriage, dramas, crises. But with the God's help and grace, I have seen them true and benefited greatly from those and sustained my marriage and feel very fulfilled at the moment. So I have also 43 years of uh, my priestly service. I've been ordained soon after I was married. So during those 43 years, I had many, many marriage counseling sessions and or conflict resolutions and numerous premarital or marriage preparatory meetings. So that's another reason why I feel that I can talk about this on, on this topic. Negative reasons are we are all aware of the society in which we live at the moment and that there is a very bad marriage status in the society there are defeating statistics, there is pressure and attacks on marriage, political stances and governmental regulations, negative discrimination, minorities tyranny, especially LGBT, education system and public intellectuals are also attacking marriage, big corporations, Popular figures and media are promoting all sorts of trends against uh, marriage, as they call it, traditional marriage. But also us married people are attacking marriage when we do not live up to the standard standards of a Christian marriage. So all of the above is actually a downstream from the devil's attack on marriage. All those people, and we all are influenced by devil because he is the enemy of whatever has been instituted by God. So some of us knowingly, some unknowingly, but we are all actually under the influence of devil. And may God help us and save us all because there are detrimental consequences for the society as a whole because of all this. So I will talk tonight uh, not from an expert scientific stance or give you exposition or comprehensive theological view on marriage. I will just simply share my pastoral experiences and vision. It will be a quick overview of statistical data and I will touch on essential marriage dilemmas in the contemporary society with the intention to awaken our interest in a Christian Orthodox understanding of marriage and offer some practical solutions based on Orthodox understanding of marriage. So this, is, this talk has been designed or intended for youth who are ready to start a relationship serious relationship, 
for the engaged, for the newlyweds, especially first ten, 10 years of marriage, but also can be, be fitting for all uh, general Christian Orthodox audience. Let us go to statis statistics. In 2022, Australia recorded its highest number of marriage registrations at 127,161, marking a significant increase from the previous years which were affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. It was 78 in 19, and no, in 20, 78,000 marriages, and 89 in 21. The crude, crude marriage rate for 2022 was 6.1 marriages per 1,000 eligible individuals. It was a recovery from the five years prior, but still below pre-2015 levels. The average age for marriage in 2022 was 32.5 years for men and 30.9 years for women, indicating a slight increase compared to previous years. And sorry for using the Statistical Bureau classification language. Uh, marriages, so-called marriages among same-sex couples increased in 2022 but did not exceed the numbers from 2018 and 19. And in 2022, only 56% of Australia's adult population was married, married or in partnership, as they call it. Among those in relationship, 59% were men and 53% were women. 30% of Australian women have never been married. From 2018 to 2022, the median duration of marriage before separation in Australia ranged between 8.4 and 8.9 years, with the duration to divorce ranging from 12.1 to 12.8 years. As we all know, less people are getting married. Over the years, there has been a fundamental shift in social attitudes towards marriage in Australia. In mainstream Australian society, there has been an almost total erosion of the social stigma attached to the living in sin, as we say. Today, couples regularly live together and co-parent children outside marriage. There is also less practical pressure on couples to marry as a committed couple has much the same legal and social rights as a married couple. For instance, a de facto couple can access the same property rights as a married couple and is also able to access similar, although not identical, social security and taxation benefits. Earlier we mentioned the marriage crude rate and gradual declining in recent years. The changes to society's views on marriage are truly reflected in the crude marriage rate if we look a little further back in history. In 1970, the crude marriage rate was 9.6 compared to now at 6.1. The reduction in the number of marriages and the marriage rate could be attributed to there being more socially acceptable alternatives to marriage, which we will discuss below. In contemporary Australian society, the landscape of personal relationship has undergone and continues to undergo a transformation with traditional marriage no longer being the sole pathway to long-term commitment. I will just mention the growing popularity of, al of alternatives such as cohabitation before marriage, partnerships and de facto relationships. Cohabitation or living together without the formalities of marriage has become a common step in modern relationships. This arrangement allows couples to experience day-to-day -day life with their partner before deciding on marriage. Partnerships beyond cohabitation, the concept of partnerships are, has also gained traction. These partnerships, often equated with romantic relationships, 
do not necessarily lead to marriage, but are based on mutual respect, love, and commitment. This form of union respects the autonomy of each individual while maintaining a committed bond. De facto relationships hold a significant place in Australian society as an alternative to traditional marriage. Legally recognized, these relationships are akin to marriage but without the formal ceremony. Couples in a de facto relationship live together on a genuine domestic basis and have their relationships uh, acknowledged by various legal statutes. This recognition provides many of the same rights, as I mentioned before, and responsibilities as marriage, covering aspects like property distribution, financial agreements, and child custody. And also, I have to mention that the so-called same-sex marriage has been legalized in Australia in December of 2017. Now let us look at some data from the statistics of divorce. Divorce rate, the most recent divorce rate in Australia is 2.5 divorces per, per 1,000 Australian residents. Divorces granted in 2021, total of 56,244 divorces were granted in that year, impacting approximately 30,000 children. And applicant types for divorce were male applicants 11,000, female applicants 12,000, and joint applications 25,000. And marriage and divorce totals, total marriages from 2003 to 2022, so that's roughly 20 years, total marriages were 2,275,000, total divorces 994,000. Almost half of marriages ended in divorce. New South Wales has the highest number of divorces in 2022, that's 14,661, which can be interpreted as having the highest divorce rate among all states. 10.8% of marriages in Australia are second marriages, and 60% of those marriages end in divorce. Regarding the impact on children, the percentage of divorces affecting minors has decreased from 68 in 75 to around 47 in 2014, with a slight increase to 48 by 2021. This gradual reduction reflects more divorces among couples whose children are already adults and broader social trends, including lower fertility rates and an increase in childless couples. Where does Australia divorce rate stand? The rate of divorce in the world has risen over the last half century, but this rise has to be not been even, resulting in notable disparities between countries and regions of the world. The highest rate of divorce in the world is Russia, with 4.8%. Actually, that's the crude. 4.8 people per 1,000 people, while the lowest divorce rate is in Sri Lanka, with 0.15% per 1,000 people. The divorce rate in Australia sits in the midpoint of this range, with 2.4 per 1,000 people or residents in 2022. This places Australia behind the United States at 2.5 divorces occurring per 1,000 people each year. So that, let us see what would be statistical conclusion. Enormous, almost existential marriage crisis. Malfunctioning or the, the dysfunctional families. All sections of the society are affected and are victims as a consequence of the marriage crisis. And most affected are the innocent children, especially minors. To illustrate the effect, statistics show that the children from this dysfunctional and broken families have an increased suicide rate, more than 80% with girls and more than 300% with boys. 
most common reason for the for marital breakdown and this was searched across the web social scientists and other scholars have studied the issue of what leads to divorce some looked at easily measured factors some others ask divorce people why they think their marriage ended i compared the results from some of the best studies and made a list of top causes of divorce <coughs> before i read the list it's important to state that there is usually more than one reason as to why a couple gets divorced and those reasons are intertwined. For example, people are more likely to have extramarital affairs when they are experience, experiencing other problems in, them, in their marriage. Another complicating factor is that couples often disagree about what caused their breakup. One says one reason, the other one says the other reason. So number one reason stated is the lack of commitment. Number two is incompatibility or drifting apart, no shared values, religious differences and sexual difficulties. Communication problem or lack of communication. Infidelity or, or unfaithfulness or extramarital affairs, number four. Financial issues, number five. Alcohol or substance abuse, number six. Emotional abuse and domestic violence, number seven. Conflicts, constant arguing without resolution, number eight. And then age of the married people plays some role whether they marry too young or too old, and also difference in age between husband and wife plays some role. And number 10 is lack of love, intimacy, sympathy, trust, respect, no emotional connection or unrealistic expectations. All these stated reasons are self-explanatory and there is no need to elaborate more about them, especially because we will come back and discuss some of those when we touch on the most important reason, in my opinion, which I want to draw your attention to. You probably already noticed that there is no firm definition of marriage mentioned anywhere in the statistics or studies. On the contrary, we have seen many different sorts of unions or partnerships, as they are often called, that are named or treated as marriage. Remember the marriage alternatives we have mentioned such as cohabitation, partnerships, de facto marriages, and even so-called same-sex marriages. How many times have we heard people talking negatively about marriage, but completely lacking any understanding of a true marriage? Most of those would say, I don't need that piece of paper to have a success successful partnership, meaning relationship. So marriage for those is a legal contract, agreement, tax benefit, or other convenience. When I ask those people what they think is necessary or bonding ingredient for their relationship, they will name love. When I ask them what they think love is, I usually get different answers. But the common denominator to, to those answers is absence of understanding of the term love, which gets mixed up with attraction, lust, sexuality, or loosely understood kindness, politeness, tolerance, understanding, agreeableness. Before we jump to the conclusion and judge those people as ignorant and or brainwashed, let us analyze what is our understanding of love. Yes, love is a key ingredient of a marriage. But what sort of love? We talk about love very casually today. Most of us know very little about it. We say, I love cats. I love traveling. I really love a good steak. We even use the expression falling in love, implying that love is like walking along, not paying much attention and suddenly falling into an open manhole. Origin or source of love is God himself. 
Love is the essence of his being as the Holy Trinity. We think that love is an emotion, a sort of feeling we arrive at or acquire because of a pleasant experience, unintentional action, blind faith, chance or luck. If we carefully contemplate our Lord's words, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. We only then arrive to the more appropriate understanding of what real love is. It is a sacrifice. It is a product of active self-sacrifice. Definitely not a subjective emotion of a sin sinful human being. Real love is more like planting a seed. It does not grow overnight into a flower. It needs proper nourishment, regular weeding, and constant care to grow and achieve its full beauty. The fullness of married love can be experienced only by those who know the Lord Jesus Christ and are living members of his body, the church. Jesus does, does at least three things for a husband and wife when they abide in him as the branch abides in the vine. He provides them with an example, a pattern they can use when they try to discover what true love really is. He comes to abide in them through the Eucharist to make them truly one. And he provides them with the Holy Spirit who enables them to express true love. For example, St. Paul tells us what kind of love God expects us to have for each other in the epistle lesson that is read at every Orthodox wedding. And he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. This is the kind of love we are to have for each other in marriage. And this is the kind of love Jesus alone makes possible. It is only the presence of the living Christ within us that can help us develop the sympathy, the understanding, the forgiving spirit, the considerate love which true marriage requires. When we read studies about, about reasons for divorces or analyze marriage stati stat statistics, it is obvious that there is no understanding of the origin of marriage. Marriage is not a human invention or creation of any state or any political organization or educational institution. Marriage is pre-political, not a human institution at all. It was founded by God. The author of marriage is God himself. It was God who made the race male and female. It was God who, who commanded be fruitful and multiply. It was God who said it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. It was God himself who brought the bride to her husband in the first marriage. It was God's word that declared for all ages, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall, shall be one flesh. It was God who instituted marriage as Jesus said, what therefore God has put together, let no man, man tear asunder. But God has not merely instituted marriage. God does not invite a man and woman to the bonds of marriage and then abandon them unaided and alone. He has provided guiding principles and divine grace to ensure its success. The best insurance policy for a successful marriage is God. Best ally. Yes. Trials, as I mentioned for my own marriage, trials and difficulties we will have. But he will give us strength to overcome them. Disappointments and sorrows we will meet, but he will give us the patience and the endurance to see them through. Problems we will have to face, but he who is the way, the truth and the life will provide the way out. Several years ago, a famous female writer was asked, how does a woman make a good marriage great? And she answered, that's easy. She simply works like a dog. That goes for the husband too. 
Good marriage and good marriages don't come by accident. They require the consciousness and conscious effort of two dedicated people. But the results are well worth the effort. A happy marriage can be the most satisfying experience of life. Marriage is a work of art, as somebody said, that is never finished. It is the most challenging and complex of all the works of a human being. It is not like painting or poetry or architecture or a novel. We can never put down the tools of this art form, step back and pronounce the work complete. And the two shall be one, said the Lord. Becoming one is an ongoing project, a lifelong process of continually becoming one at all the different levels, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. As someone said, marriages are not made in heaven. They come in kids and we have to put them together. This oneness cannot be achieved by the couple alone. For the one who can truly make us one is God himself. I hope we understand by now that the proper understanding of a marriage and its natural environment is God's love in his body church with a sacrificial love as the key ingredient. Understanding a Christian marriage through becoming one is possible only with God. And now we will just point out some practical advices for either those who plan to start a serious relationship, or those engaged, or those who have been recently married, but it can help also general audience. First and foremost, we have to invite God to our marriage. Still in our community, most people get married in church. They are wise enough to invite God for their first day of marriage. But what happens after the marriage? Do they ever pray together in their homes? Do they go to church together? I doubt. And that's the very ser serious problem for a marriage. So we should be wise to invite God into our marriage every day of our marriage. Husband and wife praying at least once a day together will bond together. Even better if they can do it morning and evening. Once they have children, they should add children to that common com or communal prayer at home. Because the prayer is the bonding ingredient for the family. For the newlyweds, or those who plan to get married soon, you often hear, even in a secular language, people talking about this is my other or my better half for wife or, or sometimes for husbands. <laughs> and that's, that originates actually from Christian understanding of marriage. We understand uh, male and female as two halves coming in marriage together, becoming one. And in some way, man, either male or female, is not really complete or not of age until he is married. Because if you remember from the Genesis, creation of the world, that only when the, the Eve was created after the Adam, he gave them blessing to govern the world. So that's very important that we understand that is that getting married is actually for the glory of God and to fulfilling his commandment. Marriage is holy and marriage is divine, divinely instituted. It's not human invention as I already pointed out. So we get married and we hope that we will have a happy marriage. But we very often have 
ideas that we need just to be lucky, you know, to find a good wife, and we will get a good marriage. And it doesn't work like that. Happy marriages don't grow on trees and we just pick them up. Happy marriages are actually made by a lot of sweat and blood. Marriages actually function as an investment. We will get only out of marriage as much as we put into it. Certain people don't care, don't pay attention what's happening with their wife or husband. They pursue their careers, their everyday life, their habits that they already developed. And one day they wake up to the, this uh, ruined marriage. So that's what happens when we don't pay attention to what we are doing. Actually, as I said, marriage is an investment. We have to invest a lot and we have to sacrifice a lot. What do we sacri sacrifice in marriage? We sacrifice especially our selfishness. Us married people shouldn't be talking I probably never again once we are married. It should be always we. And there is at least one positive thing in contemporary society I can name is when the husband says we are pregnant, if the wife is pregnant. <laughs> I think that's, that's a, one of the very, very positive things because, yes, it's not I anymore, it's not me, it's us. Once we are married, we should understand that my life, not just here on earth, but in eternity depends on the marriage. So we have to be serious about it. We have to be committed. But not serious to... We have to be close. We have to communicate. But we cannot hang on each other's throat all the time and suffocate each other. So we have to understand, especially newlyweds, that we need to be together, but also to have time separately. Some males like love hunting or fishing or golf or whatever, having a beer on Friday night after work with their buddies. And w women should understand that and allow for that. And if they don't brag about it, they will be loved for it. And the other way around, if wife loves shopping with girlfriends, occasional meetings, coffees or whatever, that should be okay. Nothing wrong with that. And if you don't, if you as a husband don't object to it, don't make drama about it, you will be loved for it. So we have to sacrifice a lot and invest a lot. But in, in order to get a happy marriage. But different people have different ideas what marriage is. Some people try to find happiness in being successful in their careers. Some people try to find happiness in being rich or famous. Some try to find happiness in drugs or alcohol or sex or whatever. It is true that all these mentioned things and some more actually can provide some pleasures for us or some satisfaction. But the problem is uh, it's not lasting. It, actually, the more we have of it, the hungrier we become. So we are never fulfilled. We are always chasing like a cat is chasing its own tail. That's how we, if we set on that path, how we feel. So the only true fulfillment and real happiness we can find in God and in happy home. So that's why it does pay to invest. I know that the contemporary young generations don't like any, to come anywhere near, when you mention sacrifice, cutting the cross, or investing, or no, they just want to have fun. That's all they have interest in, some of them. So, a lot of hard work and sacrifice is needed and investment for the true and lasting happiness and fulfillment in marriage and in life. We also enter into marriages unprepared. I personally did. Even I was probably better than so many others because I made a list what I would expect my wife to be, ideally, 
and then I cross some things because it's impossible, <laughs> because I compared myself to it, and then had to cross so many things because I didn't match those. So I was realistic, but still not very prepared. How we get prepared for marriage? First, by understanding that two people get married, we believe in providence of God. God puts two people together. Sometimes we are not conscious at all what's happening. We just see somebody, somebody nice looking or nice as a person, and then we, we get attracted to the person, and then eventually we become married. But that first initial attraction actually was used as a tool by God to bring those two people together. And the other thing that we have to understand is that two people usually completely different God puts together. So that they only can function, uh, function fully and properly if they are together. So because I'm weak in, in certain areas of life, my wife is weak in the other areas, but when we are together, we cover everything. So that works as a perfect match or perfect couple. That's how God usually puts people together. And plus, as you know from science, that plus and plus don't, they can't come together. So, <clears throat> providence of God plays a role. We should prepare for marriage. And the Holy Fathers recommend that preserving our chastity is the best preparation for marriage. Unfortunately, these days, we have a practice that people get married 30 or older. In the meantime, they have multiple sexual partners. And I think the statistics show that 4.5 different partners people have before they get married. So they, four and a half times, they tried, they consumed something that's sacred, that's reserved for marriage before they were married. And they failed, and then the fifth time they think that they will make it, which is impossible. So we also should test ourselves and try to understand and, and discern, do we have a calling for marriage? When I was 17, 18 years old, I was at seminary school preparing to be a priest. And when I was a little kid, I understand if I'm a priest, I can get married. But being in a seminary school in a monastery, I've seen some people uh, taking monastic vows. And I was just, it's beautiful. And I thought, I might become a monk. But then I have to test myself. Do I really feel that calling? Can I really be the monk that I should be? And I couldn't imagine, yes, I can imagine many things about being a monk, but I realized that I would be very sad without wife and without children. So it wasn't for me. I wasn't called to be a monk. I was called to be a married. So that's why I married. So we should take more serious approach generally uh, about how we prepare for marriage. So we live in a society that's pushing the individualistic ideology, just, you know. Society is also consumeristic, just more, better, more expensive, more travel, more, better car, bigger house, and just spend, 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 even get to death, and that death gets us in the end. Many of younger people talk, even the little kids talk about their rights, but they never mention any obligation. Everybody is talking about rights. And we live in a society that actually we seek compensation and sue for damages. You know, we never see ourselves responsible for anything or to be blamed for anything. So, also, who repairs anything these days? I'm of gen generation that I remember repairing my shoes, my belt, my even my pants. These days nobody repairs or very rarely anything. Even the mobile phones, our dear mobile phones, we don't replace. Eventually we will replace screen. 
But if, if there is a bigger problem, you just throw it out and buy the new one. That subconsciously actually give us an idea in a relationship. If it's not functioning, or if there is a problem, just replace it. Throw it out. Try another one. And one little girl asked her Baba or Grandma, how come that you managed to live with Dada or Grandpa for 50 something years? And she said, the answer was beautiful. She said, I belong to generations when we used to repair everything. So she wanted to say, yes, we had many problems in marriage, mm -hmm. but we repaired it. And that's actually something necessary for happy marriage or successful marriage. We have to repair things in marriage. You can't just throw it out as soon as something is wrong with marriage. Also, <clears throat> there's so much, so much depression in the society, like among the younger people who are to get married, seeing all those dramas and, and failing of marriages, breakups, kids, uh, all sorts of, of, of obligations once you, if you divorce and you have kids, you have to pay and your wife and give half of your, even your superannuation or whatever. People are scared and depressed. They don't want to get married. Even if they get married, they don't give everything that they have. They somehow do it with some reservation. And that's the biggest mistake you can do. If you decided to get married, give everything you have. Even if it does fail, at least you can sleep and say, yes, I've done everything and it didn't work. But if you, if you fail at marriage and then you realize that you could have do better, you probably be, will be very, very sorry that you didn't put that extra, that extra might save your marriage. So once we are married, actually, we have to understand that we have to set our priorities right. That's another common, most common mistake among married couples, especially these days. Nothing and nobody else can be but God, number one in our life, once we are married. Even our children, common children, don't qualify for number one place in marriage. Number one for wife is husband, number one for husband is wife. Then come children, then parents, relatives, friends. Then probably number four, career. Then something else. Unfortunately, we see every day I come across people whose priority number one is career. Or some sort of pleasure, traveling or whatever. And they expect the marriage to work. It's impossible. You can't. So set your priorities right. Understand that your wife or your husband is priority number one. Only God can, I say, be about that. And actually, when two people get married, they are not alone. As I, I mentioned, providence of God putting people together. And when they invite God to their marriage on the wedding day, and every day of their marriage, but God is constantly there about them. And the purpose of marriage is not, that, is not just procreation and, 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 uh, and prolonging the human race. It is actually to grow together in love towards each other and towards God. That's the purpose of marriage. So it never ends because we always can give more to each other and grow closer to God. So these days we have marrying people at older age, which is another problem for marriage. Why? As we grow older, we develop our habits, we develop our character. And the purpose of marriage is actually, uh, not purpose, but the, the thing, main uh, thing in marriage is to adjust to each other. Because in marriage, or in life, or anyway, we cannot change other person, even if we call that person wife. The only person I can change is myself. I can eventually influence some change by good example or by soft speaking and, and uh, civilized discussion, but not by banging the desk or shutting the door or, or screaming. That's, some people have ideas, I will change, you know. 
especially Balkan people. I will show her, you know, who is the boss. That's another thing, power struggle. There is no room for power struggle in marriage. And most of the people have that idea that who is to dominate the relationship. There is no room for power struggle or domination in marriage. Because we are equal in the eyes of God. When we say equal, the Bible talks about husband being a head of marriage. It doesn't mean that wife is subordinate in any or less important or less being in any way. Bible talks about different functions as body and head. Because head without body is skull. And body without head is corpse. Only together their body and head, they are functioning. So that's what it means in the end when the uh, Bible mentions that husband is the head. They have different functions in marriage. If we go back to Genesis and story of creation, you remember that God created Eve when Adam was asleep. He took one of his ribs and the ribs are as Adam, when he woke up and has seen Eve, said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she will be called Eva, which is, I don't know what's the English, but a Jewish original has like, in Serbian it would be Čovek and Čovečica. Someone that st uh, stands face to face to you, right? like your other half, as we said, like a pandan, Ish Isha, that's in, in Jewish, which means originally that. The, the person that stands face to face to you, that's your other, like other half, that completes you. So, they are equal. But, as soon as we say equality, some people get ideas, okay, you do the washing, I'll do the cleaning, you do this, I do that, it has to be 50-50. No, it can't be 50-50. Why not? Because that's not love. That's partnership. That's business. That's something else. Love does not search what's fair and where is the 50%. So, how we do it? I do everything I have. I invest everything I have for my wife and she invests everything. That Sometimes I give only 10%. Actually, in many areas I give 0%. Like, because I never vacuum, I never wash dishes, I never wash, do the washing. That's zero percent. But that's how we function. I'm not recommending this as... <laughs> as <laughs> <laughs> we married, as I said, 43 years when it was almost a standard. And we, we worked out that way. But she doesn't know what it means, how much we owe, on the, uh, what's the mortgage, what the bills are or some other, so many other things that I take care of. And we function perfectly like that. So, I'm talking about principles, but every single couple has to find its own way how they function. Because there is no rule, kiss this many times a day, say I love you this many times a day, and then you will be happy, or you do this. No, it doesn't function like that. Do everything you can, and everything you, you to please the person you have chosen. We don't get married in, in Christian understanding of marriage. We don't get married to please ourselves, but to please the person we have chosen. Apostle Paul even talks about not having anything on my own in marriage. Not even my own body belongs to me in marriage. My body belongs to my wife in the nicest possible way and the other way around. Even during the fasting, I cannot deny myself in that respect to my wife under the excuse that I'm fasting. It has to be mutual. It has to be mutual. That's, see how blessed the marriage is, how holy it is. There's nothing sinful in it if we understand it properly. It's a gift of God. It's made for our salvation. 
that sexual part in marriage is made to, for, there are three reasons for it. But the reason number one is to prevent us of fornication. So marriage is holy and we are equal and there is nothing I should uh, consider my own in marriage. Everything below, belongs to both of us. So St. Paul says that Jesus is the one in whom all things co cohere or hang together. And during the marriage ceremony in the Orthodox Church, the couple say yes to each other. Yes, I love you. Yes, I promise to stand by you. But as they say this, they do not stand alone. They stand before God's holy altar. So they say yes also to God. Yes, Lord, we love you. Yes, Lord, we invite you into our marriage. Yes, Lord, we cannot truly love each other unless your love abides in us, unless you who are love abide in us. Then God says yes to the couple. Yes, I bless you. Yes, I will be with you in your marriage. Yes, I will put my love into you if you open yourselves to me through prayer. Yes, I will walk with you. Yes, I will never leave you or forsake you. So marriage in the Orthodox Church is saying yes to each other, yes to God, and hearing God say yes to our union with each other. Invite God, all those married. Invite Him into your marriage each day, and He will hold you together. Through pleasure and pain, He will make you truly one. And now I'll be happy to conclude this. We can talk, and we should actually introduce uh, marriage preparation uh, sessions for people who get uh, intend to get married, at least five, if not ten, because there's so much ground to cover and so much negativity about marriages to, to fight. So I hope that Bishop will introduce uh, that as a norm uh, for the, all the people who want to get married to attend at least five sessions with their priests or somewhere to prepare for marriage and to uh, uh, learn some things. There's so many things that we can learn. I said, I mentioned, I was learning hard way, making mistakes in my marriage and then paying for, for, for those mistakes. But with the help of God and grace of God, I managed somehow to survive and to, to even benefit and, and, and understand the marriage. So instead of going through that hard way and risk your marriage, it would be better to prepare and learn some things before we get married. Thank you. Thank God.